I'm sure you do. I'm doing really well, thank you. How are you? Oh, great. We're well, freezing uh, over here. What's that? We're cold over here. Oh, we're going through, yeah, a, a terrible yeah. cold wave. It's been nonstop. Yeah. 25 some... degrees right now. Or, I'm going to okay. look. Okay, we're I'm... ready. Oh, I was going to. You better stay here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're good. It says Great. you are so, screen screen sharing. Is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Um, that means we can see your screen. Um, and we are now live on YouTube, just so you guys know. So I'm going to give it um, just a couple seconds to let people trickle in. Um, it's 7.02 now. We'll wait till 7.03 if that's all right with you guys, and then we'll get things started. Um, but for those who are here already in the audience, hi, welcome. Um, and yes, we'll get started in just a second. You, you can slip away whenever you wish. Okay, well, um, I will kick things off by um, introducing the Loon Preservation Committee, who we are, um, and you know why we host presentations like the one that you're going to see tonight. So my name is Caroline Hughes. I'm a biologist at LPC. And we're an organization that was formed in 1975 in response to a really noticeable and dramatic decline in New Hampshire's common loon population. The founding principle behind LPC was that if human actions had contributed to those declines, um, and it seemed very likely that they had, then human actions could also help to reverse them. And so since 1975, that's what we've been working to do through a combination of population monitoring, management techniques, research, and education. Um, and so the education part is a really big part of our mission. Um, we seek to inform the public about loons specifically and about the natural world in general. Um, and so tonight's presentation really fits in well with that part of our mission. Our presenters tonight are Virginia and Daniel Polishik. They are a husband and wife team who have been studying common loons in the Pacific Northwest for 27 years. During that time, they've conducted research on the stressors affecting the species at the southwesternmost edge of its breeding range, and they've used their research to inform conservation measures to help Washington. They've monitored loons in Washington since, that, since 1996, and in that time, they've identified individual banded loons and recorded loon behavior through photography and video. Tonight, they're here to share some of their favorite stories from their many years of observing loons. Um, and Ginger and Dan, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and you know you can take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, yes. Carolyn. Thank you for having us this evening. Uh, we are Daniel Polishuk and Ginger Polishuk, and it's great to be able to present this to you tonight. As we start, we are presently at our home at Loon Lake, Washington, and it's 25 degrees outside, and uh, we hope wherever everyone that's watching uh, has good weather, may not be the case but uh, we hope everybody is well. We thank Carolyn and LPC for hosting this presentation. And we also thank the hundreds of individuals and all of the agencies over the years that have helped us. Uh, many of you have become treasured and lifelong friends, and we thank you. We will start by providing a brief summary of our conservation work in Washington, and then we'll get into the more exciting part of the program, our favorite loon stories. This is the image that started our loon conservation back in April of 1996. This is on the shoreline of our home at Loon Lake, Washington. We quickly grabbed our cameras and uh, tipped over a picnic table to crawl behind. We figured the loon couldn't see us behind the picnic table. Uh, from what we've learned since then, we know better. <laughs> but anyway, we grabbed a, a sequence of images, and this was one of them, way back in 1996. And uh, just for your information this evening or this afternoon, all of the images that you will see in this presentation are ones that we have made. So as Carolyn mentioned, we've been conducting common loon research in our state in Washington and throughout the Pacific Northwest since 1996. A total of 451 common loon chicks have hatched in Washington since 1979. 
And these are the 42 common loon breeding territories that have been active during that time. About three fourths of the chicks that are hatched and 93% of all common loons banded in Washington have been from the Northeastern corner, uh, which is where we do our primary research during common loon breeding season. During the winter months, we travel around from uh, state to state and uh, try to headquarter over by the Pacific Ocean so we can see wintering common loons. And from those surveys, we have compiled a robust common loon demographic data set. The surveys of our uh, wintering migration loons and also from the surveys that we have made on our breeding territories. This is the location of our home at Loon Lake, Washington. As you can see, it's conveniently located within our study area. That makes it nice for us to travel. This map of North America shows the southern limit of common loon breeding in the west in about 1976. The black dashed line, as you can see there, uh, the bottom of the two dashed lines that you see is about the approximate location of loon breeding back then in 1976. And since then, there's been a rather dramatic contraction of the breeding range up to the red dashed line that you see. And if we compile the amount of years and uh, how far it has moved, it's moving northward at approximately 14 miles per year in the Pacific Northwest. So our challenge at the start of our common loon conservation work in the late 1990s was to slow that retraction rate or even to stop it entirely. Increasing numbers of common loon territorial pairs in surviving chicks since then indicate that that is being accomplished. A larger scale map shows the southern limit of common loon breeding in about 1850 during early settlement in the West. And this is the present southern limit of the common loon breeding range in the Pacific Northwest. Breeding has been extirpated from California, Oregon, and Idaho. This is a research area in Northern Washington. There's also common loon breeding areas in Northwest Montana, Northwest Wyoming. Montana's common loon population is slightly larger than in Washington, while the population of breeding common loons in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is about half of what we have here in Washington. This plot shows the productivity of common loons in Northeast Washington from 1979 to 2021. The colored lines represent four different things that we keep track of, the productivity of common loons in our Northeastern study area. And you can see the different colored lines there representing territorial pairs, nesting pairs, chicks hatched, chicks survived, and a productivity index. Uh, this graph is rather hard to read, but you can see the overall trending upward of the different parameters that we maintain and, and uh, record. This uh, trend line map or chart shows a better representation of what has been happening over the years. We started our work in 1995 and we only had a handful of loons in the state of Washington at that time, less than five as you can see on the chart. And we started applying our conservation work in about the late 1990s. And you can see the dramatic upswing in productivity since then. The gap that you see between the chicks hatched and the chicks survived has been because of the increasing bald eagle population, which prey heavily on the chicks. Here we see a bald eagle attempting to capture a common loon chick. This is a, an image that Ginger made as so we were on a territorial lake. And we wanna tell you that the number of bald eagle nesting pairs in Washington has grown dramatically uh, during the years 2005 to 2015, the nesting pairs went from 100 in Washington all the way up to 1,334. So that's about a 13 times increase in the number of bald eagle nesting pairs. 
in Washington. So they have preyed heavily on the common loon uh, chicks, um, and they also take their eggs from time to time. The bald eagle is by far the number one predator of common loon chicks in Washington. We and our extensive network of common loon rangers have witnessed many common loon chicks being taken by bald eagles. This is a summary of our conservation efforts for common loons in Washington. And you can uh, rejoin our presentation later and read on through these. The list is numerous. And if you want particular information, why please do that. This is the most probable cumulative reasons why common loon productivity is increasing in Northeast Washington. And again, you can rejoin this presentation and read through that. We were the featured photographers for two loon books written by Dave Evers and Kate Taylor. One was Call of the Loon in 2006, and the other was Journey with the Loon in 2014. We also provide our images for different science journals. This is the cover image of Bioscience in January of 2007 which was featured on a paper by Dave Evers et al. And this image appeared on the cover of Journal of Wildlife Management. This image was featured in National Geographic magazine. We wanna show you what we use uh, for equipment that we compile our images and compile our surveys. You can see that we've got um, a lot of equipment strapped onto this poor John boat. We have electric motors in the front and rear. We have uh, two converted office chairs to serve as platforms for our large telephoto lenses. We use two 600 millimeter lenses and two 100 to 500 Canon lenses to acquire our images and video. And uh, we use telephoto lenses for a very good reason. And that is to stay far enough away from the loons that we don't change their behavior. That has always been our goal. And that's something we have maintained over the years. Territorial adult common loons too frequently become mortality victims from lead toxicosis and from lead fishing tackle. And um, we learned this very early as we were applying our conservation efforts. We had x-rays made of all of the possible mortalities the cause of death of this common loon was determined to be lead toxicosis from lead fishing sinkers. We compiled a spreadsheet and statistics of common loon mortalities in Washington based upon the causes of death and found that the leading causes were from lead toxicosis from lead fishing tackle at 39%. Dr. Mark Pokras, a professor and veterinarian at Tufts University, provided causes of death for us. He's performed over 3,500 common loon necropsies, and he is a leader in North America of the conservation effort to ban the use of lead fishing tackle. So we decided with that information that we should do something about that. And we compiled a recommendation that we presented before the state of Washington. And that was a recommendation to ban the use of lead fishing tackle in Washington. And that was back in the year 2009. We had um, uh, quite an effort to get that accomplished, but we were successful. And because of that legislation, we now have a ban on lead fishing tackle on 13 common loon nesting lakes. And we can tell you that that has had a dramatic positive influence on reducing the number of lead toxicosis common loon victims. This pamphlet was widely distributed in Washington. It describes the problems for loons and other water birds associated with using lead fishing tackle. This was put together by Ginger and Karen Honeycutt, uh, the wildlife program director at Colville National Forest. And we thank her and her agency for that. We also use family to help with conservation. And this is our granddaughter, Kaylee, with a sign, look out for loons. And here she's just four years old. We place these signs at all of the common loon nesting lakes in Washington. I failed to mention that Kaylee is now working on dual master's degrees at Middlebury University. And she's now presently at this moment in Italy. 
So we next are going to talk about our favorite loon stories. We'll get away from the statistics and the scientific information part of our presentation. And we're gonna talk about people that made a difference with our work over the years. Here we see a youngster who made a remarkable influence on the common loon um, interest in Washington. Madeline at this age, uh, she was four years old and she decided she wanted to have a, a common loon chick doll that she could play with. So here she is sewing that up. Notice the color of the sock is accurate as a common loon chick. So then we check the next image here and we see that uh, this is how baby loons actually ride on their parents' backs. And in this case, the parent is Madeline. So Madeline and her mom created a very accurate loon suit with efficient wings that allowed Madeline to fly around the rear deck at her home. Madeline then went trick-or-treating in her neighborhood wearing the completed loon costume. She decided to make loon cards also. And this one shows a bald eagle here attempting to capture common loon chicks. You can see one that's in peril because it's not on mama's back. This one located right here. And this one's in safety of the bald eagle above. So Madeline decided to sell her loon cards that she had made up along with cookies and a variety of other things that she had in the red wagon. And she was very successful with this effort. Who could turn down such a pretty young lady? Anyway, she raised $640 in this event. And uh, it was just a remarkable thing for her to do that. And we thank her and her mom for the inspiration they provided for that. Madeline designed this library display. And you can see in the background there, there, there are numerous of versions of her charts and uh, different items, including a constructed nest with uh, fake loon eggs. So she was uh, quite a gal and uh, she still is presently doing loon uh, conservation efforts in her area. Our first loon story is uh, intertwined with another couple that greatly assisted us through the years, Dan and Berta Furlong. They retired to the region where we are studying loons, which is fortunate. Dan was an avid fisherman on a lake adjacent to the home of this territorial adult. He quickly became acquainted with him and named this loon Papa. And Dan often joked that he was the second best fisherman on the lake and Papa was the very best. Papa was a fierce defender of his territory. He protected his young chicks very effectively. Here we see an image of Dan Furlong calming Papa when he was banded by talking very calmly to him. And this was a voice that Dan uh, had applied many times to the loon. The loon recognized it and was calmed very effectively. I was gonna add a little bit to this story. Papa was trembling and it was very noticeable. So, we knew that Dan and Papa had a relationship. So we asked Dan to go behind Papa, put his hands on him and kind of secure him and then start talking to him. And as soon as Dan told Papa he was there, the loon turned and looked at him and immediately stopped shaking. It was incredible to watch. Here we see another version of that banding evening. Uh, this is Patty Baumgartner on the left from the U.S. Forest Service. Dan Furlong additionally calming Papa during the banding procedure. And then BRI biologists Jim Peruk and Dave Evers. Dan Furlong also greatly assisted us by building a rescue nesting platform uh, for a nest that was quickly being overtaken by rising lake water. As you can see in this image here, the rescue platform was very effective. We physically brought the nest, protected the eggs and put them up on the platform. And 10 days after we did that, 
two checks are successfully hashed. And we were very pleased about that. We often invite Loon Rangers and friends and family to join in our banding efforts. They are very well attended. And here we have granddaughter Kaylee again, who's four years old, slipping on a yellow band on this common loon chick. You can see Lucas Savoy and another BRI biologist on the right as he's conducting the actual banding. Here's Ginger holding yellow after the banding procedure. We had conducted comprehensive surveys on this lake during the previous year. And uh, so the adults and the chicks knew us very well. Several weeks later, this is yellow, sporting the yellow leg bands, practicing takeoffs. At age 12, here is yellow making her first flight around her natal lake. She visited several lakes in the region after she fledged and before migrating to locations where water bodies do not freeze. And on this flight image, you can see the yellow leg band. So two years later, we were conducting surveys of common loons on a migrating lake. And we could see a group of loons on this lake about a half mile away. The ginger started making her common loon greeting calls. And almost immediately, we could see that one of those adults in that group was approaching us to our position on a bluff overlooking the lake. This loon appeared and swam around below us. And through the telephoto lens I was using, I could see that this was the bird we had banded that we called yellow. So it was great to see her again. Yellow returned also to her natal lake region at age three. And uh, banding again provides us with positive identity. We first saw her at a great distance. However, following Ginger's making greeting loon calls, Yellow approached us very closely in our boat. We have learned over the years that loons have a very good memory. And we were convinced by the actions of Yellow on that day that she remembered us. Here is Yellow bill dipping, showing her approval of our presence and the apparent joy of seeing us again. Sadly, this is the last image of yellow that we made. Yellow became one of about 75% of the banded chicks in Washington that do not return to their natal lake region. So we wonder, was she just passing through at the time that we saw her? We hope that she could be nesting elsewhere. So the rest of this presentation is dedicated to the memory of a very prominent loon that we call Dagger was the most successful territorial pair in Northeast Washington between the years 1999 and 2020. He was a beautiful territorial male. Of the 17 banded chicks that returned to their natal lake region in Northeast Washington, five of them were fathered by Dagger, more by far than any other territorial loon. Four of them became productive territorial adults in their natal lake region. You'll hear about them next. Dagger and his two mates have more strongly influenced the genetic framework of the loons that occupy territories in Northeast Washington than any other territorial adults. This is Dagger on one of his 19 nests from 2002 to 2020. And here he is on the fifth of his 19 nests uh, that he had from 2002 to 2020. Of the many common loons we came to know, Dagger was our favorite. He was the most productive territorial male of the region, having fathered 29 chicks in 19 nesting seasons. He was a territorial male of all of those 22 seasons. He was the most intelligent territorial male we ever knew. He defended his chicks from bald eagle predation better than any other loon in the region. He always spent more time attending to his chicks than his mates. We never once witnessed any other behavior than kindness to his chicks and the two mates during his lifetime. I, I would like to interject here. My favorite story about Dagger was something that we also learned. He was trying to teach his mate, who was new, his second mate, 
to stay on the nest when intruders arrived and he would take care of them. But his second mate, Zip, decided he needed help and she would abandon the nest, fly down to where Dagger was making attempts to be rid of these intruders. And he would look at her and go, oh. and he would take her back all the way to the nest and wait till she got on the nest with the egg. And then he would fly back down and uh, would work on uh, chasing the intruders off. But Zip did that about three times and three times he brought her back. And we were amazed uh, at that kind of thinking. Loons are extremely intelligent and they can problem solve. So this was definitely a moment for us that, that gave us a great deal of respect for loons and their ability to problem solve through their issues. So Dagger knew us very well because we spent a tremendous amount of time on his territory. We banded him in 2004 and he was the most difficult loon by far to band of all of the years that we've been conducting banding. We placed him in a, a very sturdy um, transport cage after we captured him out in the boat and he promptly broke through that container. The only loon that's ever broken through the containers that we use. And it took two of us, including a biologist from Biodiversity Research Institute to secure him. Dagger as a loon was only slightly larger than medium size, but uh, what he gave up in, in being a large male, he uh, made up for by being very tenacious. Dagger became regionally famous over the years while well, he was territorial adult at a campground more people came to see Dagger than for any other reason of coming to the lake. And Dagger never lost a single confrontation. This allowed him to maintain his territory all those years, visiting and potentially uh, uh, challenging other loons came to Dagger's territory on an almost daily basis. His mate Zip was very much a socialite and she would just love to entertain all of the loons that came to this territorial lake. And then Dagger eventually would have to chase them off as they became challengers. His favorite uh, tactics were to spear challengers from below or to fly low over the lake and then dive head first onto challengers. We only saw several other loons do that, it's quite unusual behavior. So instead of actually conducting battle, Dagger would evade and uh, provide a lot of threatening postures to get rid of challengers. Dagger would also jump upward, uh, attempting to attack bald eagles that were trying to take his chicks. Uh, Dagger once ingested uh, hook, line, and sinker, as they say. Here you can see the fishing line coming from his gape. And also you see a swivel here, very much uh, indicative of the fact that he swallowed a fish with fishing line. And we were very fearful from this that uh, he might expire if there was lead that he had ingested. But fortunately, he lived through this incident. And this is an image of a forest fire that uh, was approaching on August 18 of 2015. And uh, this is the last day that we were allowed to stay there because of the approaching fire. But here we see Dagger patrolling his territory. And as we show here, trees were eventually burned along this shoreline. And this is Dagger again at that same forest fire that's approaching. He stayed there along with his entire family. And uh, even though forest fires are increasingly more common now in the state of Washington, they persisted. And uh, of all the forest fires that we've had, we haven't lost uh, a single pair of loons. This is video of Dagger searching for crayfish.
He didn't find any on this occasion, but usually he does. He's very good at this. And uh, following this will be a 4K video of Dagger's five yodel call vocalizations back in 2019. Uh, he detected that a common loon was approaching his lake and he made a series of yodel call vocalizations as the approaching loon flew over his territory, but he didn't stop. And you can also hear mallards and mergansers in the background. Yeah, we're hoping this will play. Well, we'll play that for you at some other time, apparently. But um, we'd like to also say that Dagger provided the utmost care and protection of all of these chicks. And these are two of Dagger's 29 chicks that he reared over the years. This is uh, one of his first chicks back in 2003. And this is quite an interesting story. We've learned that about 25% of the chicks that are hatched in our area eventually come back and uh, try to establish territories of their own. Um, this one here that we provide for our favorite loon stores might, will show some of Dagger's chicks and his mates and how they return to establish territories on their own. So this chick had a color band on his right leg. He was so small when we banded him that he didn't have enough size to uh, convince ourselves that we should put four bands on him as usual. So his uh, color band on his right leg was yellow with a black stripe. And so for a better name, we called him Yellow Stripe until we later would learn of a more, more famous name that he had, which was given to him actually three years later. We made it a practice to check migration lakes after the fall migration of adults and chicks away from breeding lakes. We established a list of where common loons frequent on their two annual migrations. And it's surprising to us how traditionally loons use and reutilize these migration lakes over the years. It's a place where they can find food, uh, some uh, good sanctuary, and uh, are able to socialize with other loons. On this day in the fall of 2005, we were checking on a pair of fledglings that we knew were there. We had observed them on their natal lake earlier in the season. And we could see that they were being approached by this older loon. So the three of them spent time together uh, socializing and getting to know each other. And as it turned out, they became quite friendly with each other. We could see that the loon on the right, the third loon as we call it, was an older loon and slightly larger. And uh, judging from the plumage on that loon, we guessed that it was age about 28 months. Uh, that loon uh, presented some dominant thread postures uh, to the other loons showing us dominance. This is something he had learned in his lifetime of about 28 months. Short time later, we found out that we could actually photograph his right leg band. And on that band, we see that it was yellow with a black stripe. And so we knew know who he was at the time. Uh, we had seen him after he had hatched in 2003. So here he is at age 28 months. So he was a beautiful loon and uh, we really enjoyed spending time with him. You can just barely see the yellow band there with a black stripe on our telephoto photography. We spent another week with him and the other chicks on that lake. And um, we always said that you know, this yellow stripe bird was very comfortable with our presence. I wanted to add the significance of this loon was that he returned as a two-year-old bird from the winter territory in the fall to a migration lake. He came inland. And we at that time had been learning that common loons, many common loons were not just going to the uh, salt water, 
but many were going to the Columbia River and staying there during the winter. And this loon apparently was one of those because he came back early. And he, when we first saw him, he swam under our boat and we were both looking through our long lens and I heard this hoot. And I asked Jan Dan, did you hoot at the loons? And he said, no, I didn't say anything to him. And I said, oh, and I hear another hoot. And I look down four feet away from me is this loon and he's talking to me and bill dipping. He remembered us. And we didn't know he was there. Uh, we saw that he had a band, but we didn't know for sure who he was, but he knew us. So again, we're confirmed that loons have a great memory and you don't need to be on their natal lake region for them to remember you. This was an entirely different lake. And we've been on land and in boats on other lakes and loons recognize our call our talking to them, our voice, maybe our boat, and will approach us. So they have great memories. They're intelligent, they have great memories. So this is the last image that we got of what we call third loon. Um, but fortunately, his story continues. We received a phone call from the McNary Golf Course down in Salem, Oregon. And they said that they had had a loon over winter on one of their golf course ponds. So we decided we'd go down there and take a look and check things out. And sure enough, they knew what a common loon looked like. They described it very effectively. And they said it was banded, but they weren't sure what the bands were. They couldn't decipher the, the combination very well. Uh, but they knew it was a loon and uh, they had planted trout in this uh, golf course pond and he helped himself uh, through the entire winter to those trout. And one of the unfortunate parts of the story is that this leg was crisscrossed by these wires to keep away Canada geese. And about every 10 feet or so was another wire that was only about two feet above the water surface. And we couldn't imagine how this loon had actually landed on this particular golf course pond and live through the incident. And a bigger question was, how did he ever get off this lake after uh, spring arrived and he decided to move on? Well, the story is he was successful in getting away, but he crash landed as he took off. Apparently he ran into something, perhaps this tall hedge in the background. And you can see the location of where he wound up there over by Ginger, right near the curb. And this is the actual spot of the recovery location. So they didn't know who this loon was. They couldn't describe the band. So we called the Wildlife Care Center, an Audubon uh, uh, building in Portland, Oregon, and asked about if they had rehabbed the loon. They said, yes, they had rehabbed the loon. And so we said, well, we'll, pay a visit and we can chat about this. And so we did, we went there and they promptly gave us a description of the bands. They also recorded the silver band number. We had our banding records with us. It took us about all of 10 minutes to figure out who this loon was. And it was third loon or what the golf course had called Tiger Woods. We were ecstatic. It was uh, quite a story to learn about this. So now Tiger Woods was about three years of age. So they told us that they had released after the rehabilitation, the common loon in the Columbia River, just north of Portland, Oregon, just off what's known as Savi Island. So we went to that location. Uh, this had been like three or four days or perhaps a week after they had released him. And we checked this very wide part of the Columbia River there for a while and we never did see it. So even though we didn't see Tiger Woods again, he at least provided migration in information for us. He was hatched up here in Northeast Washington and he had made this migration down to Salem, Oregon. We don't know if he ever went to the Pacific Ocean or not. He was released in this location 
and the Columbia River then flows up in this direction. So here is Dagger with another one of his checks. This is green in the year 2004. This is a moment when green tumbled into the water. It was now one day old. And um, we'd like to tell you that common loon chicks can swim very well immediately when they first tumbled into the water. We've seen them even make a very short dive, uh, just three or four paddling strokes after they hit the water. So they instantly are adept swimmers. Green was a single chick this year for Dagger and his first mate. And as it occurs every year, biologists from Biodiversity Research Institute come out and ban the loons. And green was a small chick, so it only got two bands. One was a green one on a leg and uh, the other was the USGS identification number. And here's a shot of Dagger with a one day old chick green out in the, in the middle of the lake now. And uh, there's another loon approaching, so Dagger is holding up his wings for protection. Uh, later on, this is a picture of green at three weeks of age. And here is green three years later, having returned to her natal lake region. We are certain of our, her identity because of her unique leg bands. You can see the single green band there on the right leg. We regard banding to be the single most important part of loon conservation measures because it provides us with um, a basis for applying science for identifying all of, the, all of these loons, which would not be possible without banding. Green became a territorial adult at age eight and was first productive at age nine years. Here she's on a platform nest in 2017, about 22 miles from her natal lake. We know a lot about Green. We observed her midwinter several times on the Columbia River, which flows through our study area. It is probable because of those sightings that she has never seen the Pacific Ocean, where most of the other common loons go for the winters. Green has raised eight chicks so far. Four of those have been mortalities from bald eagle predation. Green and her unbanded mate and their chicks suffer almost constant harassment from bald eagles that have a nest right adjacent to their lake. Then we came upon this uh, mystery loon on a territorial lake in 2015. And based on these color bands, we had no record of a loon being ever being banded in Washington with this combination. As we photographed, we checked the monitors of our images very carefully. And we could see that there is just a hint of pink on the inner aspect of one of the bands, in this case, the upper band, as you can see right here. Without having telephoto lenses, we have never made this observation until perhaps a, a few minutes later when we saw this image. And we can easily see that uh, what was faded white on the upper band was actually originally put on the leg as a fluorescent pink band. So having our banding re records with us, once again, we checked that and we found out that this chick was banded many years later and we had given this chick the name Amelia. And you can see the fluorescent pink uh, as we released her and uh, fluorescent pink in this case over fluorescent green on the right leg bands. So, she was named then after a daughter of, of our friend and, and Loon Program Director at Biodiversity Research Institute, Lucas Savoy. And he's been helping with our loon conservation efforts in Washington for many years, as well as banding a lot of the loons there. Uh, lightning from a uh, summer thunderstorm triggered a forest fire near Amelia's territory. And the smoke was so dense that we could barely see the sun. The loons were just barely visible on the lake. Uh, we were the only people on the lake. We had to wear two masks in order to just tolerate the dense smoke. We were the only two dumb enough to be on the lake. So it was just us and the loons. We had to use flash in order to illuminate the, the loons as as we were photographing them. 
This is one of the images we got. It shows the beautiful plumage of an adult common loon uh, during a wing flap. And we found Me Amelia on that day and her mate Red X, who is not banded. I will, on, on this lake, I wanted to mention that um, we're having more and more forest fires. And the smoke is so dense many times that you can't see anything on the lake. And when we first started, we were wearing masks ourselves because breathing was difficult. We couldn't find the loon, so I decided to call because Amelia knew us from a chick on and she always came when I called wherever she was at. So I called her and shortly they showed up and this is our first picture of them arriving, looking at us, hooting and talking to us again. Um, and maybe in a subsequent presentation, we can have Ginger do some of her oh. loon calls. <laughs> Uh, she's very effective at doing that. Uh, common loons have a very uh, recognizable greeting call. When other loons land on their lake, they make that call and it's a, a short hoot. Maybe you want to give it just, oh, just one for everybody. It's just a, like a little yip, you know, they go. Whoop, 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 whoop. But I also call the chicks when they were chickies. We started not talking to them initially. We didn't want to interfere. But when we were there so often, they would come and greet us and talk to us and build dip. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, if we don't do anything back, are we being, you know, we're ignoring them. We should at least acknowledge them. And we talked back and forth. It didn't seem to make any difference. So I started to just talk to them in a hoot uh, in their loon language. And so I guess I have a certain loon call I'm part of their pack, so to speak. <laughs> and all of you that live on lakes that have loons, I know experience the same things. Your loons recognize you. They know you as long as you are a good steward and don't interfere with them or change their behavior. They will remember you in a positive way. So we knew Amelia was nesting on this territorial lake and she is being successful. We found her nest uh, on one of the spring days and we decided that maybe it was time to take Madeline out and show her a common loon nesting location. And so on her birthday in 2017, she was joined with her mother and another loon ranger that we know, Terry. And we went out on our boat to have a look at it, Amelia's nest. And this is Amelia on her nest that day. And you can see the identifying color bands there on her lake. She usually has one egg each year. And that was the case again this year. And what we feared most of all was this is a lake that has a very quickly rising water level each spring. So we were very concerned that this nest would perhaps become disassembled and float away and the egg would become adult from getting into the water. So we see Amelia here who's uh, building up her nest by grabbing material here and adding it to the nest. We didn't know at this point if the nest was actually sitting on the bottom of the lake or if it was floating. Uh, we were able to answer that question later, but we decided to help her out a little bit. There was a lot of this dead vegetation around, so we floated an assemblage over to her and uh, she quickly added that uh, to her nest material. Later on, when she was away from her nest, we decided to go in and have a look and to get a photograph of the egg and to check out. And here you can see that she actually had built up the nest from the bottom of the lake about two feet in elevation, which is just remarkable. It's just an astounding effort on the loon's part. And you can see all of the clipped off vegetation here on the sides where she had grabbed anything that was in reach to add to the nest to keep up with the rising water. Fortunately, the nest was successful, the chick hatched. We were able to get this image a couple of weeks later. And this is one of our favorite images of all time. This is Amelia with her chick in 2017. 
And another image from the same day shows us the very distinctive markings of her leg bands, faded fluorescent pink over fluorescent green. Yeah, Amelia brought her chick over for us to see, very close to our boat, came up and talked to us and was very proud of her little chick. So 12 days later, we went and found the same Loon family on that territorial lake. And you can see now the chick is uh, substantially larger in size. They grow very rapidly. And this is video of Amelia's nest the following year. And she had decided that she had had enough with floating nests because of the threat of rising lake water. So here she has crawled up substantially higher up into the cattails where she built her nest one year later. And this is video of that family pair in 2018. You can see it's somewhat of a windy day and we have a tremendous struggle trying to maintain stable video because of the boat moving around. Even though we take precautions and we have wind stabilizers on the boat, it's still a big problem. This is a story of Cheers, one of Dagger's chicks again. And you can see from this image that she's got green fishing net, monofilament line and a swivel entangled around her right leg bands. This is in the summer of 2015. We checked these bands and found out that this was a chick that had, again, one of Dagger's chicks that had hatched in 2009. And the story of Cheers is quite special because it indicates the great value of field veterinarian procedures. We found this severely compromised loon in the summer of 2015, about 22 miles from where it had hatched. To our amazement, we found this same bird in just about the same location one year later. It had somehow migrated with this horrible condition and had then returned to this lake because this lake freezes over with a foot or two of ice each winter. And we can see here that this effective bird has crawled up onto a collection of floating cattails. And we decided intervention was necessary because we could tell the loon was about to perish. And so we took our net and approached the bird and it was so weak that we captured it easily. Oh, incidentally, we were very fortunate that Dr. Mark Pokris wanted to spend a few days with us and look at our loon territory. And he was with us in our boat when we saw this loon. It was a clandestine, what would you call that? Um, very fortunate situation that we had Mark. And um, we're very thankful forever for Mark for his help with this loon. So the medical staff that we had on this day were Ginger, a retired surgical nurse of 43 years, and Dr. Mark Bokras, a veterinarian who has conducted over 3,500 loon necropsies. And the emergency tools that we had to perform this procedure were a pocket knife, a scissor, and a bottle of hand sanitizer liquid that uh, we just fortunately had in the bottom of the boat. And the outcome of this was a successful removal of the fishing tackle and the leg bands and the ulcerated growth. And this is Ginger and Mark following that procedure. This was May 4, 2016. Here are the items that re were removed off of the leg of the loon. So then we decided we need to take this bird to a lake that was not busy with other territorial loons. We knew of a lake where we had seen this bird before. And we decided that uh, this would be a good place to put this bird in the water. So we traveled to that location. We had put a, one of my black socks over the head of the bird as we traveled uh, to keep it calm. So we got to the boat launch here. Ginger snapped a few photos for us. I released the bird into the water and Mark uttered cheers, which effectively named the bird at that moment. 
And fortunately, the story of Cheers continues. And one season later, Cheers is back on this very same lake and the silver band on her left leg positively identifies Cheers. She swims under our boat and we snap a few photos and we could see that there was a slight scarring on her right leg. This is where we have removed the affected tissue in the granuloma. And you can see the resident's residual of a slight scarring there on that leg. And then the one silver leg, that silver uh, band that you see here positively identifies her. We were ecstatic. We were just absolutely delighted. So we had in place a nesting platform on this lake earlier. Uh, the ne nesting platform is necessary on this lake because it has very steep sides and a county road on the other side. And you can see that uh, if you look very carefully, there's the, the loon egg is located about right there. And the beavers who had a lodge on the bank nearby had used this floating platform as a place to haul out and then uh, chew up on some of the vegetation. So we took all of those logs off the nest to give the loons a better chance of being able to, to uh, hatch this egg. And this is a close-up view of that egg. Uh, following removing all of the logs on the nest, we decided to leave and Cheers was very friendly all the time we were doing this. She accepted our presence. We could tell that she remembered us and it was almost like she was giving us thanks for the medical procedure we had performed on her uh, some a year earlier. We revisited Cheers later on in that year and you can see that she is still dutifully on that one egg. Uh, the following year, we visit the same location. Cheers and her mate are there, and we can see the nesting uh, situation that went on there. We see the beaver lodge in the background and the single remaining natural avian guard after the destruction from the winter events, but we find no loons. We check the nest bowl and we see that there was successful hatching there based on the egg membrane that we see in the broken shells, but no loons were around, so we feared the worst. So we go around a corner of the lake and we find this loon family. Cheers is here on the left, her two chicks in the middle and her unbanded mate on the right. We were just ecstatic to find them there. And this has been one of our favorite stories over the years. So the last story that we have this evening is a story of Bob. He was a very energetic chick in the year 2016. And this is the long-term territorial male dagger again. Uh, this was in the year 2016. And this was the evening that he was banded by a BRI biologist there. You can see the group of people that had gathered to witness the yes. event. Um, we let people know ahead of time about banding and our banding sessions are very well attended. So Bob is being banded here and we decided that uh, we were going to name Bob after a good friend of ours, uh, of his memory. You can see this here. Bob Rosinski, who was a lifelong friend of ours, avian photographer and a great conservation advocate. What were you going to interject? You can see Ginger calming Bob there after he had been banded. So here's Bob uh, a few weeks later, begging Dagger for more fish. This was in the middle part of August in 2016. <clears throat> so here's Bob at age 11 weeks, just an absolutely beautiful um, chick just about ready to start flying. And here's Bob at rest in August 20 of 2016. And Bob was extremely energetic and he would come and swim under our boat, hoot on one side, talk to us on the other, go back under the boat, drag his bill in front, the side. It's like he's inviting us to come and play with him. And this was endless. He'd do it for 30 minutes 
just totally entertain us um, as we watched him. And uh, he had so much energy, we, we just knew we had to, uh, his name, Bob Rosinski, definitely fitted him. So there you can see the bands we emplaced on the right leg were yellow over green. And this is just slightly before his initial flight on September 1. And here, Dagger again, proving his worth as, as a parent and uh, as a formidable adult, teaching Bob how to make takeoffs. We've seen very few other loons do this, but Dagger would do it on, on a regular occasion. And here's Bob's first flight on September 1 of 2016. You can see the identifying yellow over green bands on his leg there as he flies around the lake. Um, I think a few hours later, or perhaps a day later, we acquired this image of him flying around the lake where he had hatched and he became a very efficient flyer. So we keep a record of all the migration movements that um, we can quantify and place in a spreadsheet. You can see our emphasis from our study area here in Northeastern Washington. A lot of the flights have originated from there most of them go westward to various parts of Washington, down to Oregon and some to California. And um, you can see that uh, on this particular occasion, Bob had flown all the way down to California where he was recited by Becky Bowen of the Mendocino Audubon Club. She made these images and found Bob had traveled to the coastline of California. And his bands here are seen as yellow over green, which positively identifies the chick as Bob. So we were delighted to see the reappearance. And from that, we we're able to show his migration movements from Northeast Washington down to the coastline of California. And he did that at the age of one. So we're delighted for what developed with Bob. So to summarize this evening, Dagger was an absolutely beautiful, territorial male. We learned more loon behavior and shared more dramatic experiences with him than any other loon. Of the 16 banded chicks that returned to the Natal Lake region in Northeast Washington, five of those were fathered by Dagger, as we mentioned. And Dagger and his two mates, Dottie and Zip, who you would meet in part two of this program, uh, he, those two mates and Dagger more strongly influenced the genetic framework of the breeding territory in Northeast Washington than any other loons. So we will never forget Dagger. You know, now what we do is part science, part art, but I would say that's always adventure. And thank you for watching our presentation. Ginger and Dan, thank you so much for that. That was incredible. Um, and it's amazing how well you've been able to document the lives of these individual loons and their offspring and, you know, seeing them uh, as they migrate and on, you know, getting the recites from the ocean. It's just really, really incredible and very interesting. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Are you, do you have time to stick around to answer a couple yes. of those? Yes, certainly. Excellent. Um, so the first one is about the size of loons, loons in Washington. So this person seems familiar with the fact that, you know, New Hampshire loons are pretty big, especially in comparison to uh, loons from the middle of the country. And so the question is, what is the size difference between Washington loons and New Hampshire loons? Um, I don't know if you know the answer to that exactly, but maybe if you, you know, could speak to their size. Yes, we do. Uh, we've uh, chatted extensively with biologists from BRI and uh, biologists from LPC as well, Harry Vogel on this very issue. And um, we have very good records of the weights of our territorial pairs. And when we compare them, they compare favorably in size with New Hampshire loons. There have been examples of loons being larger in the state of Maine that have been recorded, larger than the loons we have in Washington. At least we haven't banded any that size yet, but the largest loon that we banded in Washington is 6,000 grams. And I believe BRI has recorded some in the 7,000 gram range. 
So I would say we have maybe 80 to 90 percentile loons in terms of body size, with uh, smaller ones being in the center of the continent of North America. And that makes sense, um, seeing as the, the going theory is that the reason for the size difference is because migration distance. So being on a coast, your loons also don't have too far to go for the winter. So very That's correct. Uh, some of our loons overwinter on the Columbia River, as we talked about. Uh, one particular loon overwinters on the Columbia only 26 miles from his territory. So he doesn't have to fly very far. And coincidentally, he's one of the largest loons we've ever banded in Washington. So uh, Columbia River is unique in that it does not freeze over in the wintertime. There are 11 dams constructed along the Columbia River, and each of those provide a very good food supply for loons in the winter, consisting of uh, abundant fish and crayfish. So uh, loons don't always go to the oceans, and uh, that's becoming increasingly apparent with our work, uh, with some of the work that's being done in South Carolina in the wintertime, and uh, also in other uh, southeastern states where they don't necessarily go all the way to salt water. Another interesting fact about this one loon that's 26 miles from the Columbia River he not only goes there in the winter time, but he often will go back during the summer and leave his nesting area for a few hours. Uh, he's been observed back onto the Columbia River foraging, and then he will fly back in the summer, back to his chick or mate. And, uh, and he has a lot of fish on his territory. Uh, it's always been a question of, oh, well, He's going back, He's and, and he'll use that area summer and winter. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so there's a question about uh, whether or not you see other species of loons in Washington, both in terms of breeding or even um, in terms of wintering, or if it's just the common loon. We do, but uh, only during the winter time. We, we don't have any nesting of any other species other than common loon in the state of Washington. Red-throated loons do uh, breed just uh, slightly away from our state in Southern British Columbia. We know of that and uh, Pacific loons and yellow-throated loons breed farther north in Canada, but only common loons breed in the state of Washington. And in the winter, we do have the yellow billed, we have several adults, quite a few juveniles that will come down into Puget Sound um, of the yellow bill loon during the winter. We also have large uh, migration of the red throated Pacific. We've had an Arctic loon during the winter. Um, mm -hmm. what, uh, what else? Anything? Uh, yellow, let's see, red. Red throated loon. We got them. I think yeah. we got them all. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Here in New Hampshire, we, you know, during the migration season, we see red throats passing through and, you know, yes. we do have red throats wintering off of our coasts, but uh, none of the other species. So really cool that you've seen all mm -hmm. four uh, at various points. Um, we have a question about um, the banding. So what percent of the territorial oh. loons in your study area are banded? Um, and how many of your surviving chicks are banded each year usually? Uh, as that many is many as we can catch. Uh, <laughs> that has changed over the years. Uh, when we had few territories, when we started our work, we were successful in having all of the territorial adults banded. And, and chicks. And, yeah. and chicks. So that started out with uh, four or five territories. And now we have almost 20 territories. So that percentage has dropped down. So now uh, we usually have about one week of banding and we're able to band usually four or five adults uh, each season and perhaps the same number of chicks on a good year. So uh, presently, I would say maybe 70% of the territorial adults are banded which makes it very fortunate for us with our studies because we know how long then 
uh, they spend on these lakes. We've got statistics, voluminous amounts of demographic information. And perhaps we could present that on probably a more boring program sometime later. Uh, so one of our um, productive years, we banded a total of, I think the highest was 16. Most of our territorial adults are banded. So this was the presently. majority. Mm -hmm. Presently, we only have a few that we need to band. So the rest of the time is devoted to catching chicks. So we've had several 12, total of 12, some 16. And um, we hope we can maintain this level because um, we often get inter have an interference of smoke where it's too dangerous for people to go out on the lakes. Plus we have forest fires now that's interfering with traveling and is it safe to go to these areas? So climate change, I suppose, I'm not sure if this is what we wanna call it, but it is- but the wildfires are definitely increasing. Yeah, it is affecting what we do. And as uh, people at band loons are attending or that attend banding parties, some loons are rather easy to capture and we capture them more than once on occasion, while other loons just totally evade what we're trying to do. So some loons we have never been able to capture. And uh, on a couple of occasions, we wanted to try and, and uh, uh, recapture a geolocator that was placed on the leg of one of our loons. So, we had uh, BRI biologists come out and try a new banding technique, which is a diurnal process. And we were able to capture then this one loon in particular that we call long neck and uh, recover the geolocator and get the information off that. And that was Lucas Savoy. And Lucas was able to capture long neck in the diurnal trap, but coming out of the lake, Lucas lost his waders. So <laughs> I'm not sure he wants you to tell this story. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it was um, a decision. Do I hang on to the loon or do I grab my waders? <laughs> you know? Anyway, that was just a little side note. I'm sure Lucas will remember that. Sorry, Lucas, we told well, you. Well, <laughs> the waders are over their clothes, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's but it, it was quite comical to see. Uh, waiters down around his boots that are filled up with water <laughs> trying to hang on to a loon. <laughs> Lots of crazy things happen during uh, field yeah. work excursions. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Banding uh, events uh, are, are hilarious on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so a hot topic recently, um, both here in New England, you know, New Hampshire, Maine, New York, um, but also in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, has been loons getting iced in. And so uh, there's a question about whether you see that much in Washington and um, if there have ever been ice rescues or anything like that out, out there. You know, we have never once had a report, <laughs> nor have we ever seen an iced in loon. And the reason for that is loons out here in the West start their nesting one month earlier than in other parts of the country. And because of that, they finish up their breeding season an entire month earlier and migrate one month earlier than loons from other parts of North America. So that kind of precludes them from getting iced in. But that's just a fascinating story that uh, we are hearing about uh, I know LPC successfully captured 10 just recently. Isn't that correct, Carol? Well, BRI. Yeah. And BRA uh, rescued yeah, five. 10. And, and I know the folks, uh, Adirondack folks in New York also captured some. So Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of, you know, across different hearing. states, a lot of those rescues recently. We yeah. have, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit, Carolyn? I could talk about it a little bit. I don't want to, you know, take too much away from your presentation. Um, but yeah, so 10 loons got iced in on Lake Winnipesaukee, which is actually um, the lake that LPC's headquarters are on um, mm -hmm. in a small, small opening. Uh, we went out, we used gill nets and landing nets. And over the course of about four hours, we're able to catch them all one by one. So even in that tiny opening, you know, those loons are, loons are diving and, and trying to evade you. And it took a long time to get them all. 
um, we managed to catch them. And, you know, when we were evaluating them, we realized that most of them ha- were uh, in the midst of the molt of their primary feathers. So even if they had enough open water to take off, they wouldn't have been able to um, because they, they'd lost those flight feathers. They physically could not get up in the air. Um, and so we think that that has something to do with cl- uh, climate change, um, the lake staying open a little bit later, you know, warm weather in the early winter, sort of overriding their instinct to leave. And then, you know, by the time the lake starts to ice over, it's too late for them. They're in the middle of that molt. Mm-hmm. Um, I know uh, at least a couple of the loons that BRI rescued in Maine, I believe, had the same issue. They were in the middle of the molt um, and at least one of the loons that was rescued in New York as well. Um, so something that's happening definitely could be a climate change impact um, and something that a lot of groups right now are very interested in and, and are looking at and trying to figure out. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that in our winter studies um, here and also down in the Gulf and, and with Darwin Long, um, we found that the loons are molting. Some loons start their wing molt, the males, about the end of December and January and February, at least for here Mm -hmm. in Washington state. And sometimes our lakes, if we have a warm winter, our lakes don't freeze till January. So these loons usually are gone by the end of October. Mm -hmm. Um, Occasionally one, if it's a late chick, they'll stay with the chick. We've seen that happen the end of October and first part of November and we watched Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure they got off that lake okay. But um, yeah, we don't see icing in of loons yet. Uh, We're hoping that won't happen, but we don't, it'd be interesting to figure it out. Yeah, and interestingly, so three of the 10 loons that we caught um, were banded and, um, and all three of them were males. So I, yeah, I wonder, you know, we have blood from all of them. We can do DNA sexing. And I wonder if there's going to be a skew in the ratio of males to females that were in that group of 10. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, we have a couple males that stay longer than the females, but the rest, they all, the males go first, usually. And there's a comment here from Heinrich, who is uh, on the lake where the loons iced in, in Maine. And it looks like I was mistaken. They were all juveniles. So none of those five were in molt. Um, but I, you know, all of our loons here in New Hampshire were in at least one of the New York ones as well. Um, we have a comment from Lee Addicts who just says, hi, Dan and Ginger, love the banding work and how it was informed by your loon conservation interests. So, uh, Lee's here and says, hello. Um, and it looks like we're, we're done with all the questions. The rest of the comments in here are just, you know, very complimentary towards you in terms of, you know, how great the presentation was, how great the photography was. Um, and I'd like to echo those and, you know, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge um, and experiences with us. We really appreciate it. Great. And we thank everybody for watching and thank you again to everybody that has helped us over the years. And thank you, Carol, and thank you very much for having us. We appreciate it. We're so glad to have you. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night tonight. Okay. And thanks everyone for attending the presentation. Yeah. Cheers. Um, we'll- Cheers. <laughs> Here.